I would now like to introduce Dean Amy Christoph Brown. A highly respected faculty member and researcher, Amy serves as the college's senior associate dean before stepping into the role of dean last December. Thank you so much for being here today, Amy. Thank you, Ashley. It's my pleasure. It is truly my pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Courtright, who is going to be your presenter today. Uh, Professor Courtright developed an early passion for business as a bookkeeper for his parents' floral shop in Boise, Idaho. After completing his undergraduate degree in accounting from Brigham Young University, he worked for Deloitte as a tax accountant before receiving his PhD right here at the University of Iowa in the Tippie College of Business. He served on the faculty at Texas A&M University until 2020, when he returned in the middle of COVID to the Tippie College of Business as the Henry B. Tippie Research Professor of Management and Entrepreneurship and as our Director of Executive Education. In that capacity, he led the startup of the Tippy Leadership Collaborative, which is a center focused on excellence, sorry, a center of excellence focused on delivering executive education and research consulting to organizations across the country. His award-winning research on organizational leadership, teamwork, and employee engagement has been published in top research journals, as well as being featured in the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, NPR, and Forbes. He's the recipient of several teaching awards and currently teaches classes in Tippy's executive MBA and undergraduate programs. He has also done executive education and consulting for various Fortune 1000 and government companies, sorry, government organizations, including John Deere, Caterpillar, H&I, Halliburton, and the Veterans Health Administration. Most importantly, he and his wife, Nicole, are the proud parents of four children, and together they enjoy traveling, exploring the outdoors, watching Hawkeye sports, and volunteering in their church. So thank you, Stephen, for being here with us today. Uh, I am very much looking forward to listening to the webinar, as I know the rest of us are as well. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much, Amy and Ashley. Thank you for organizing this, and thank you to everybody who has taken time out of their busy schedules as you're thinking about the very topic that we're going to address today uh, to be with us here today. And so I appreciate uh, all the... the uh, uh, the attendees here. The, the, there's a group of attendees that I'm especially appreciative for today that I want to mention before I get to the content. And that's any of you who are tuning in today or members of families of any of those who are veterans of the armed forces. I'm very grateful for you and proud to know both professionally and personally many veterans from all the different branches of the armed forces. And while you may not think of yourself like this, truly my family and I view you as heroes. And so thank you for your sacrifices, for your service and the part you've played uh, in keeping our country safe and free. You're an inspiration to me and to all of us. And we appreciate it once again, your service. Now to start off the webinar today, I want to just tell a quick story. Amy mentioned about me coming during the middle of the pandemic to Iowa when we made the decision to come back here. Uh, we didn't know the pandemic would hit, but of course it hit. And something else hit too uh, during the first couple of months that we were here back in Iowa, and it's the 2020 derecho. Many of you who live in Iowa will recall this very, very, um, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll recall this very, not fondly, but uh, you'll certainly recall it anyway. It's August 10th, 2020. Everybody has a story about it. Here's my story. So I'd been working from home from the time that I'd started Iowa, which was on June 15th, and had been, again, working at home every day. And then August 10th, I came into the office for the very, very first time. Never gotten my keys, hadn't been back in the building since I was a PhD student here. And so I back out of my driveway, and I should say that as I back out of my driveway, I'm looking at my yard, which I had spent a lot of time working on my yard. That's one of my hobbies. Um, and it looked really perfect. And I and I backed out and I remember thinking to myself, this, this really looks exactly the way I want it to look. And then around one o'clock or so, all hell broke loose. And while I was gone um, and all over our area, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City and elsewhere uh, here in Iowa, uh, there was a series of storms that I'll talk to you about a little bit later what those, how those were formed, but it's called a derecho. And when I came home to this beautiful, perfect place, uh, or so I thought, um, we had a tree that was blown over in our driveway. You can see there uh, the picture of our driveway. That's my very kind neighbor, by the way, who before I got home started chainsawing uh, the, the tree that had fallen over our driveway so that I could actually get into the driveway. And there was debris strewn all over the yard. 
Now, we had some uh, minor damage to the exterior of the house as well, but overall, we suffered much less than others did in our state when the 2020 derecho hit. In fact, not a single storm in modern times, even tornadoes, caused the amount of economic devastation that occurred with the 2020 derecho. Uh, it's estimated that over 1 million homes and businesses lost power, including mine. There was about 850,000 acres of crop loss, $11 billion in economic damage between destroyed farmland and property. In fact, that storm alone, the 2020 derecho, accounted for over half of the total economic cost of all storms in the U.S. during 2020. And it's actually the costliest thunderstorm in U.S. history and the third most costly natural disaster in modern history. Well, I know you didn't come here to learn about meteorology, though that might be a fascinating topic, but I do want to talk a little bit about what a derecho is because I think that it provides a really interesting analogy with the topic that I am going to talk about today, which is the Great Resignation. To define a derecho, you have to describe it essentially as a perfect storm. What happens is that it's a fast moving band of thunderstorms with really high winds that really reach up to about 140 miles per hour. And that's as fast as a tornado, but there's a difference between a derecho and a tornado. The derecho moves in a straight line. In fact, it's called a derecho because in Spanish, the word derecho means straight ahead. And it can travel for hundreds of miles. And so this 2020 derecho stretches as far west as Nebraska and as far east as Ohio, with Iowa and, and western Illinois kind of being the epicenter of the storm. Now, derecho forms when the wet air in a thunderstorm meets the drier air surrounding it. So the water in the air evaporates and then cools all the rest of the air around it. And this cool air, because it's denser, basically causes a big downburst of strong winds. And the downburst is essentially then made worse because it sucks in more dry air into the storm, which causes it to become even more fierce. And so the storm moves, moves in this case eastward and causes the amount of damage that I talked to you about earlier. Now, can these storms be predicted? Yes, to some extent they can be predicted. We can know, meteorologists can know where they're headed. We can have some signs that it may be for, uh, forming. I had an alarm go off on my phone was I, when I was in the office about a half hour before the derecho occurred, telling me to take cover. The weather looked beautiful outside. I was actually thinking about going to get lunch. I decided to heed the warning, thankful I did, because a half hour later it turned dark and there were uh, at least around here 80 mile per hour winds or so. Now, here's why I bring up the derecho. As I said before, the derecho is a really perfect analogy for what's happening with the great resignation. Let's talk a little bit about the derecho and its similarities to or the Great Resignation and its similarities to a derecho. You'll recall that when the pandemic hit back in March 2020, unemployment numbers suddenly took a turn upward. They almost reached 15 percent at the beginning uh, points of the pandemic. Now, since then, the 20 months since that rate has been creeping down until now we're at about a 4.6 percent unemployment rate in October 2021. But when that was happening, about a year after the pandemic hit, back in March of this year, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Anthony Klotz at Texas A&M, he was actually right next to me in my office at work. We're very good friends. Uh, he's an Iowa State grad, and so I always forgive him for that. Um, but he wrote a groundbreaking research article, a groundbreaking article based on research. And basically what he did is he took the vast literature on turnover that exists that's been produced by management researchers um, all over the world, really, trying to understand what predicts turnover and how organizations can prevent it. And he said, based on all the telltale signs that are happening right now, he essentially predicted that we would, over the coming months, see unprecedented quit rates. And he coined that phenomenon, the Great Resignation. It did not take long for Anthony's prediction to come true, as can be seen on the following graph. You'll notice here on the graph that I'm showing that the quit rates fell at the same time that the unemployment rates rose. We'll talk about that a little bit. There's an easy explanation for that. But you can also see that as the pandemic has progressed and unemployment has gone down, quit rates have gone up 
In fact, beginning in June of this year, quit rates were higher than at any point since 2000 when the Bureau of Labor Statistics began collecting data on quit rates. And they are continuing to rise at least incrementally over time to, to unprecedented levels. But beyond just actual quit rates, surveys have also shown that a lot of people are considering quitting their jobs right now. So, for example, according to a report by Microsoft, 41% of the global workforce is considering leaving their jobs. Some surveys that have gauged the same thing have found even much higher numbers than that, even up to a whopping 95%. Now, both the quit rates as well as these kinds of surveys capturing people's intentions to quit have caused great alarm in organizations. And in fact, it's the number one thing I will say and in my role as director of executive education here at Tippy that we hear companies and leaders worried about. Now I've asked myself, is that just something that I'm, ha that I'm hearing with people in my network? It turns out actually that the answer is no. Let me show you the findings of a really interesting recent Deloitte survey of hundreds of different CEOs. Essentially, they gave them a list of a, a whole litany of just different issues that might keep them up at night, or the way that they said it was, what would they expect to disrupt their business strategy within the next 12 months? CEOs were asked to select three of those as the top concerns. Well, you can see from the graph that I'm showing there that two concerns, and they're very related concerns, as we'll discuss, are at the top of what CEOs expect to disrupt their business, the things that are keeping them up at night. The number one thing, 73% of those respondents indicated the labor shortage that is part of that great resignation. The amount of quit rates and organizations striving to attract and to retain top talent. But related to that also is the pandemic, both in terms of how the pandemic affects the future of work as well as just some of the other challenges involved with the pandemic. So as you can see, no other worries really even come close right now to those that we're going to be discussing today. This is clearly keeping CEOs up at night. And I'll say personally, on my Google News feed, I think every single day I'm getting a new article on the Great Resignation. And so there's a lot of information out there about the Great Resignation, and much of it is really good. But as always happens, there's also some misperceptions about what the Great Resignation is and what it isn't. So let's talk about what it is. Let's talk about what it isn't. And let's talk about what organizations can do to address it. Let's first talk about maybe one big question that I see a lot in articles and that I get posed, uh, that gets posed a lot um, to me in just different conversations with people around this topic. And that is, are there certain industries or certain types of workers that are really driving these large quit rates that I showed you earlier? So some people would argue that the great resignation is a phenomenon confined mostly to certain industries or certain types of workers. And there is some truth to the industry one. So for example, the data seem to suggest that hospitality, retail, and food service have been the hardest hit. That's according to just the Bureau of Labor Statistics data. There are other smaller scale surveys that have also shown that tech and healthcare have also been hit by it. In the end, while there are certain industries the data show that have been hit harder by the great resignation, what the data also shows that to one degree or another, most industries have been affected by these large quit rates. And so this is something that spans across industries. Again, the degree to which industries are affected by it does vary somewhat, but to one degree or another, most industries have been affected by it. Now, a lot of times when things like this happen, there's also saying, well, who is it that's driving this? Is there a certain segment of the workforce besides just based on industry? For example, younger workers, are these darn millennials or, gener or Gen Z workers the ones who are driving it? Well, as you dig into the evidence on that, although there's some anecdotal evidence and some really small scale surveys to suggest that maybe it is younger workers, there's also other small scale surveys that suggest, no, it's more mid-career workers. And so frankly, based on the evidence that I've seen, I do not see any real conclusive or real convincing evidence that it's, that it's younger workers or mid-career workers who are really driving the great resignation. 
We don't really know that 100% for sure, but again, I don't see really clear or convincing evidence that it's younger workers or mid-career workers who are primarily driving this. And frankly, we tend to overplay generational differences more than we should anyway in a lot of our research, it turns out, in a lot of our kind of discussions around work issues. And so I'm not, again, totally convinced yet that younger workers are driving this. So in that case, then the great resignation is not just a function of industry or it's not just a function of a segment of the workforce. It's a little bit more complex than that. In fact, it's a lot more complex than that. The bottom line I think that I can share about the great resignation is that it's an immensely complex phenomenon and it can't be answered with a single solution or from a single perspective. This is where the derecho comes back into play. Just as there are multiple factors, there's dry air and there's cool air, and they're all kind of converging together to create this downburst of winds in a derecho, the Great Resignation is really a, a factor of multiple things all at play at one single point in time. For example, it's a confluence of forces between uh, that, that come from economic uh, issues, from social issues. And all of those converging to affect the psychology around how, as individuals, we make decisions about whether to stay or whether to leave an organization. But in combination, together, these economic forces and these social forces are creating this downburst of psychological forces, which is then influencing the record levels of turnover that we see. And so this is why I say not a single solution or a single perspective can explain the great resignation. It's a lot of these different perspectives that really help us to better understand this important and vexing phenomenon. So let's talk about each of these. Let's talk about what's really, what are the economic forces, the social forces, and the psychological forces at play here that are explaining the great resignation. Let's talk about economic fact forces first. One of the things that's really interesting happening right now in the labor markets is that there's changing power dynamics in that labor market. For many, many years, the power dynamics in labor markets have been much more on the side of the employer. Generally speaking, there were often more applications or more applicants for jobs than there were available jobs. And so organizations could be picky in a sense. But in essence, one of the key features of the Great Resignation is that has now flipped. There are simply more options, and with that comes reduced certainty. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But bottom line is that the power dynamics have shifted in a really interesting and often, not to overuse the term, but unprecedented way toward the employee side and away from the employer. Now, with that in mind, one thing to also bear in mind is that prior to the pandemic, there were people who were, surveys show, considering leaving their companies. But one of the basic things that we find in, in research on labor markets and why people move within their labor markets is that when, there's in, in, when uncertainty is introduced in that market, the people tend to become more risk averse. And so, for example, if somebody is thinking about quitting before the pandemic and then March 2020 hits and pandemic hits, then the uncertainty of leaving their job is greater and therefore people are less likely to take the risk of leaving their organization. But as the power dynamics shift, there's some pent up resignations where then once the risk becomes lower for leaving, people are more likely to leave. And so there's this pent up resignations that are playing a role in some of the economic forces at play here. Now, as this is happening and as power dynamics has sh shifted and as we see the larger quit rates, we and it, it, overall, as we just see more movement in the labor market, there's also more options. And so companies are having to kind of up their ante if they will, when it comes to pay and benefits, signing bonuses and other types of incentives. In turn, this has created a greater incentive for employees to look around for what options they might have. We do know from research that having more options does result in people's intentions to quit being higher. So all of these economic forces together are at play. A lot of them, if really, in fact, most of them do to this perfect storm created by the pandemic. But economic forces aren't all that's being that's going on here either. The pandemic has also introduced really new and complex things when it comes to the employee experience. 
For example, remote and flexible work has become almost a staple of organizations now, many organizations anyway. For example, one group of researchers found that before the pandemic, only about 6% of employees worked only from home, and about three quarters of employees had never worked from home. This, of course, has completely flipped, where now nearly two-thirds of organizations are offering flexible or remote work options. But with this change also comes a few complicated issues, especially around child care issues, especially for dual income families, which now make up about 60 percent of, 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 of workers. We'll cover those complications a little bit more in a bit, but suffice it to say that child care challenges have also made social, the, the, the social forces at play here due to the pandemic a contributing factor to the Great Resignation. There's also safety and there's other societal concerns where employees are looking for options that increasingly allow them to be able to uh, have flexibility to attend to child care, keep themselves safe uh, physically, uh, mentally as well. And so we see all of these different factors just kind of coming together at the forefront during the last several months, which again, in combination with the economic forces are contributing to this downburst of turnover. But in the end, markets are made up of individuals and individuals are complex decision makers. And so we really also have to look at the psychological factors at play right now too. As noted earlier, the, the pandemic, uh, with, with, as it's progressed, has shown that there's been lower unemployment rate and so and more options for employees to move, and so uncertainty has been reduced. And we know, again, from research that when uncertainty is reduced, people's propensity for risk, i.e. looking for a job, increases. So that's one factor at play here, but also the other psychological factor here at play is that survey after survey shows that people are more burned out now than ever before. It's always been a concern, burnout, but right now it's higher than ever before. And if there's one consistent correlation that we found in research that predicts turnover, it's dissatisfaction and burnout. But those are not the only drivers either. What we find in research, too, is that people, even if they're not completely dissatisfied with their job or even burned out, do react to big external shocks like a pandemic in terms of reconsidering the, the role of work in their lives and the centrality that it has in their lives. And so the pandemic has given people time, in essence, time or at least a motivation to reflect on the importance of work to their lives and the roles that they have in their organizations. And in some cases, even their impending mortality. And so we know from research that people look for meaning in their professions, but people may be even more keen to look for meaning in there when there is threats of impending mortality or when there is such a big external shock is what happened with the pandemic. And so this desire for meaning and balance, whether that means being able to dedicate more time to family and hobbies or being able to live where you want to live or being able to find an organization that better fits you and your values, those are also at play. All of this in combination together, again, is creating this downburst of forces that are creating these record levels of turnover. So again, just to repeat, there's not a single solution or there's not a single perspective that both explains or solves the great resignation. It's a combination of forces. Well, with that kind of complexity, what are organizations supposed to do when it comes to the great resignation? Well, first start answering that question. Let's just examine first what companies are doing right now. In the same Deloitte survey that I mentioned earlier, CEOs were asked to indicate which actions they had taken during the last 10 months to strengthen their company's ability to attract and retain talent. Now, you can see the different approaches that are used here on the graph that I'm showing you, and we won't have time necessarily to go over each of these different approaches. But what we do is we'll pick a few of these and we'll talk about how these approaches taken by CEOs compare with what research on turnover has shown so that we can have a nice comparison between what's happening and maybe some best practices suggested by research in terms of being able to attract and retain talent. Again, we won't get to each of these, but we'll get to as many as we can, as time permits.
Let's talk about flexibility first. As you can see in the graph here, 80% of CEOs indicated that they had taken some stride, make it made some strides or taken some action towards increasing flexibility in the workplace. Now we know from research that there are some great benefits to introducing increased flexibility at work. For example, one of the things that we know from research is that one of the things that motivates people toward high performance is that they feel a sense of control or autonomy over their work. And often, more often than not, flexibility brings that kind of control and autonomy that people are looking for. And so it has some positive motivational effects. We also know that increased ability for some can help to reduce what researchers call work family con uh, uh, conflict, work family conflict, or the extent to which work interferes with family responsibilities and obligations. So in a sense, then flexibility can provide needed motivation to do the work. It can also help people better balance work and family. But it gets a little bit more complicated than that, too. There's some downsides to flexibility that CEOs and many people don't always see. And let me just kind of cover a couple of those, not because I'm discouraging flexibility by any stretch, but only for us to have an understanding of the trade-offs that are involved with increasing flexibility at work. One of those downsides of flexibility, one of my good friends and colleagues, Michael Wesson, who's at Auburn University, did some research looking at onboarding process and kind of cultural assimilation of new employees when they do so remotely versus when they do so in person. He talked about this as shaking hands with a computer. And essentially what he found is that while people were able to learn their tasks well by having a more remote setting for learning their, for, for, for uh, during the onboarding process, what they did not feel was a strong connection to the culture, to the company. And so sometimes organizational commitment on the part of new employees was reduced when they were you know, going through the onboarding process in a remote fashion. That can be one trade-off then potentially is overall commitment or what we might call it kind of call culture development too. One of the other downsides that has really started to come to the forefront too, and one of our colleagues here at Iowa has been very much on the forefront of this, Beth Livingston, where we've looked at how flexibility may help some workers, but actually may not be the best for other workers. Some of those other workers that sometimes when it comes to remote work, for example, is one form of flexibility that may have actually been more harmed than more helped by, uh, by remote work are working mothers. And so we've learned from some data that that working that, that that moms are sometimes the most reluctant to return back to the labor market because of the oftentimes societally induced caregiving responsibilities that fall upon their shoulders. And so there's some trade-offs there in looking at different demographics of the workforce when it comes to increasing flexibility. Again, I don't say any of those downsides to suggest that these CEOs or any other leaders looking to increase flexibility are off. It's just to suggest that there's trade-offs in every decision that we make. And so that's what that's certainly the case with flexibility. Now, the same thing too is is goes with the more attention to culture piece that the that the CEOs have indicated they've tried to to work with in order to strengthen their ability to attract and retain talent. Now, culture is a difficult term to, to talk about and to really disentangle because oftentimes it can be an umbrella term to mean a lot of different things. But one thing that we know that really influences culture and the overall employee experience is the web of relationships that people have at work. And we know from a lot of research that people tend to feel more embedded in their work when they have strong ties with people in the organization and the broader community. Increased flexibility and in remote work has sometimes made those ties at least more difficult, maybe not impossible for sure, but certainly at least more difficult. And so as we pay more attention to culture, one thing that we might want to consider is how are we strengthening relationships between coworkers to create that kind of embeddedness that makes people want to stay. Now let's talk about increased pay for a little bit. In part, this is happening because whether it's the economic forces um, or even the social forces at play here, pay is one of the major things. Again, 50% of CEOs have, have, have done increased pay as a way to attract and retain uh, talent. Now, this is not without uh, th th this is not without either precedent or without empirical or research backing. 
a couple of years ago, my colleagues and I published a study in a journal called Strategic Management Journal, where we looked at how does higher pay influence people's propensity to stay at an organization when their coworkers leave. We did this actually in executive teams. And what we found is that higher pay essentially induced people to stay with the organization, even when their coworkers were leaving, sometimes in droves. So pay, higher pay can be a way to retain people, even when they see their friends and their colleagues leave. But that said, pay isn't everything either. I find really fascinating one Gallup research study that showed that on average, it takes more than a 20% raise to lull a worker away from a boss who they feel really engages them in their work. And they also found that it's a next to nothing chance to keep an employee when a boss is, when a boss is not, or to, uh, the next to nothing chance to yeah, keep an employee when the boss is not engaging. So in other words, pay makes a difference, but it pay is not in this vacuum, if you will. There's other forces simultaneously at play, and that includes how people both are treated and engaged by their direct supervisor. So that leads me to one more factor to discuss here, and that's more on the training and the development piece here. 47% of CEOs indicated that they had invested in more training and development as a way to strengthen their ability to attract and retain talent. Now, most of the time when we talk about training and development as a way to retain and attract people, we talk about it in a sense that it helps people feel more invested in uh, or invested in by the company and thus feel more obligated to be able to stay in the company. But let me put a twist on that also. Training and development does in fact, research shows, help people to feel that the company has invested in them more. But training and development also helps retain people by improving managers' ability to lead others. The training development industry is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry, and well over 50% of that industry is dedicated solely toward managerial training. And it turns out from research that interventions to, imp to improve uh, leadership and managers in organizations on average really work and can work quite well. And so the training and development is not just for people to feel, again, that they're being invested in by the organization, but can also be to help managers to be able to engage their employees, going back to that, to that uh, Gallup survey that I mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, what we oftentimes see more anecdotally than anything else is that when a big shock happens, the pandemic was a really unprecedented and global shock. But even when other shocks happen into an industry or an organization, oftentimes one of the investments to go by the wayside, if you will, is investment in managerial training. And yes, there's obviously some pragmatic reasons behind that, but it's also important to understand the risks behind that too. If organizations are keen on keeping their top talent and understanding that pay and flexibility and even attention to culture are not themselves panaceas toward keeping and retaining employees, then we also have to understand that people's experiences with and relationships with their supervisors make a big difference. And so there's a risk to not investing in managerial training. What's the risk? Well, let's talk about this a little bit because the, there's an old saying. I remember my very first job at Deloitte, I was meeting with one of the senior managers in my, in, in, in my organization. I remember her saying, you know, I really enjoy the organization that I work with, but in the end, I don't quit because I really love the partner that I work with. And there's an old adage that says people don't quit companies, they quit bosses. And is that true? Well, in a really large scale, what we call a meta-analysis or kind of a quantitative summary of the literature on turnover, one of the biggest predictors that we have found on turnover is what researchers call leader member exchange. In essence, what that captures is the quality of the relationship between a manager and their employee. And we found that these kinds of high quality relationships make, in essence, one of the biggest differences in terms of retaining top employees and retaining any employees, but especially top employees. 
Research shows that those kinds of high quality relationships are established from a foundation of trust that the leader builds with the employee. And then they're reinforced and deepened over time as both parties, manager and employee, feel that they give and they receive in the relationship. Giving and receiving effort, feedback, resources, information, respect, etc. It also happens, this quality of relationship also emerges as the leader is successfully able to cast a vision for where the group is going and in the process also is willing to challenge the status quo toward a brighter future. We call this in the research transformational leadership. And so while any of these that we mentioned earlier, increased flexibility, increased pay, more attention to culture can in and of themselves be helpful, the quality of relationships between managers and employees we learn from research actually makes perhaps an even bigger difference. Now there's another role we learn from research that managers have that can also make a big difference in terms of retaining their employees and that's provided needed role clarity. In essence, what role clarity is, it's that the people have a feeling that they have clear guidance on what's expected of them in their jobs, what the goals are, what gets rewarded, in other words, to have as much role relevant information as possible. The thing that role clarity does is it essentially not only reduces stress and burnout, but it also avoids job creep, which we've learned from different surveys also has become an issue during the pandemic as organizations have oftentimes tightened their belts um, in response to the uncertainty in the market. And so having managers providing role clarity is a really critical way in essence for them to retain their employees. It's, and this doesn't mean then that it just means reducing the workload. Role clarity really means, again, giving information about that workload. So, for example, a Corn Ferry survey found that while many workers don't mind having higher expectations or additional responsibilities, in fact, they said that not having enough work to do is more stressful than having too much work to do. They also want to see their compensation and recognition match the higher expectations and workload. And so managers can play a role in being clear about the employee's expectations, how those expectations relate to the organization's and group mission, and also ensure that people who contribute more are rewarded more. That kind of leadership, which is called contingent reward, is the technical term for it in the research literature, is also one of the biggest predictors of people staying in their jobs. Now to conclude the presentation. There's not a single thing, again, that explains what is happening with the Great Resignation. It's this complex combination of economic, social, and psychological forces all occurring at once due to that exogenous shock of the pandemic. And so it's likely that retaining employees not a simple one solution approach, but rather it's a multi-pronged approach. Today, we've discussed a few different levers that can be pulled and some of the upsides and downsides of those levers. But the one thing that seems to have the most upsides is improving the quality of leadership in our company and by helping leaders to know how they can strengthen relationships with their employees and provide more role clarity. And so just in the end, this is where I want to put in just a tiny little almost shameless plug for the Tippy Leadership Collaborative and how we can go to work for you. What we do in the Tippy Leadership Collaborative is we partner with organizations to develop custom corporate education programs that develop managers in the kinds of skills that we're talking about today, as well as other skills that support your company's goals. And we deploy our very best educators, scholars, and consultants to be able to do this. These programs can range from a few days to even a few hours. And we can also, in the process, help you diagnose what's good, what are the problems in the organization. For example, what are the causes of turnover in your organization? And we can deploy our world-class group of researchers to help solve that problem. And finally, what we can also do is connect you with other engaging faculty speakers here at Tippy that will share their knowledge and insights about whatever problem it is that you might be facing or that you want to cover at your next event or conference. And so, again, the way to compete in the volatile labor market right now, in part, and from research shows in large part, is by developing the best leaders possible for your organization. And in essence, we can help you do that. So hopefully today in that sense, in that sense is a conversation starter. I appreciate the opportunity to present about the great resignation here and uh, welcome now to have your questions as, uh, as uh, moderated here by Ashley. Thanks Ashley for doing that. Yeah, of course. Um, so we do have some questions coming in in the chat. So like I said in the beginning, we'll do our best to get to everything. 
Um, I'm sure, as everyone knows, this is a very popular topic. So thanks, Steve. Um, the first question comes from John DeArmond. To what extent do you see federal spending the stimulus um, to combat COVID-19 contributing to the economic forces to resign? It's a really good question, and there has been a lot of debate on this. Um, I will approach this. Um, I am not an economist. I did study economics during my undergraduate, and that's the extent of which I have. So I'm not an economist. Um, but I will say this. There's a lot of debate on that question, and there's a few different ways in which it could potentially be contributing um, or not contributing. So one thing, for example, is we talked about these pent-up resignations. Um, we, When people feel like there's less uncertainty, they're more likely to take a risk. So one one argument that's been thrown around is that the, the, the federal government unemployment benefits and other things have basically reduced uncertainty for people. And so they're more likely to go look for other jobs or more likely to not re-enter the workforce. And so that is one argument to it. The other side of the argument, and this is again something that can be that 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 has been thrown around, is that the 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 subsidies what they've basically done is they've helped people for a limited time and so over the course of time there it's not it, it it's essentially not going to influence it one way or another it's not necessarily sustainable in that sense and so there's been some arguments saying you know we should do away with these in some cases there's been arguments that we should continue them in essence, what I would say is there's a very split opinions on this, and I don't have one uh, strong opinion one way or another on it, other than to say that both could be true. There's, and, and in the end, I think it revolves around uncertainty. The less uncertainty that people feel, the more likely they are, they are to venture out into the markets um, or to look for a new position. And that may or may not, the government, the, the government uh, 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 kinds of uh, uh, aid that's been given may or may not be contributing to that, uh, to that uncertainty. But it all revolves around that uncertainty is what I would kind of say bottom line. Um, another question we have comes from Christina McAndrew. Is it true that relationships with leaders is as important in service workers as it is in the higher skilled industry workers? That is a, also a very good question. I don't know that I have data to present that it's more important in one kind of industry or one segment of workers than others. What we do find is that it's important across the board. Are there some degree differences there? I don't know, and we don't necessarily have data to be able to speak on that, but we do know that it is important across the board. So it kind of is parallel to the whole thing of the great resignation too. Do we see some resignations happening higher in some industries? Yes. But the great resignation has touched every industry one way or another. And kind of parallel to that with the when it comes to service workers, the relationships are important. We know that from a lot of service worker. We know that from nursing. We know that from retail industries. But the relative importance, we don't have a whole lot of data on. What I would suggest is that it's important across the board. Uh, the degree of importance may be up in question right now. There's, there, there, there is not enough data that I have anyway to suggest what, uh, to have a firm answer on that one way or another. Bottom line, it matters across industries though. Um, an anonymous question has come in and said, um, I'm gonna try to paraphrase it because it's a little long. Are, they, are people cutting into their savings or retirement in order to stay afloat while not working? Seems like this would have a lot of downstream effects. Well, so let's think about that in terms of the uncertainty argument again. So if people do have savings, if people do have um, other forms of, you know, whether it's revenue, if, it that, if that's a side gig, um, one of the things we found, for example, anecdotally, people are turning a lot to side gigs during this particular economy, or they may be going more entrepreneurial. Um, and some of that may be because they do have the savings. Some people are just transitioning into retirement at this point because they do have the savings. And, and so people may be transitioning out of the market or they may be changing their role in the labor market because the uncertainty has been reduced. So do they make a difference? Yeah, savings clearly make a difference. Where those savings are coming from, that can be from a multitude of different sources. Some people argue it's from government. Other people argue that it's from personal savings. It could be a combination of those. But in essence, again, reduced uncertainty means greater movement in the labor market. Um, we have a question from Patrick Cosgrove. Um, he asks, 
did the actions taken by CEOs to retain talent actually have an impact? It seems like some actions would be muted under COVID, work from home mandates and full virtual work. Allowing working from home loses its value when everyone must work from home. Emphasizing DEI when a worker is isolated at home with a little to no direct interference from others. Yeah, um, I think I'm going to address that first question. There. I think it's a good one. Did the actions taken by CEOs to retain talent actually have an impact? Well, one thing, of course, we'll see is that you can't necessarily measure the the validity of one action in a short period of time. Some of the data being poured in on this is going to play out over time. But that's what I tried to show also. Like, this is what CEOs have done. But oftentimes, we might say, okay, so the panacea is more flexibility at work. But also being able to, uh, uh, you know, understand the trade-offs there is important. And so we do find, for example, greater flexibility on average helps the workers to be more motivated. It may uh, help reduce work-family conflict, but can also come at the expense of working mothers. Um, it can also come at the expense of culture development and strong interpersonal ties within the organization. So in essence, each of these actions may or may not work. Um, and we'll kind of see that it's the, the time is the test there on a lot of this. But I think what's important right now is not necessarily whether those actions worked. Again, data will tell that as we go in the future. But as we make decisions in the face of uncertainty, understanding the trade-offs that are involved in it. And so flexibility is one of those where we've kind of mentioned some trade-offs there. And I hope that's helpful for just understanding the trade-offs so that then we can make a decision that is really custom to the organization and enables us to be able to advance our strategy as an organization, human capital and otherwise. Um, another question comes from Josh Tinkle. He says, in addition to those 4 million or so quitting each month, which amount of that those people are retiring, which I'm sorry, I know you just sort of were speaking to and I was trying to find that. That's question, okay. <laughs> no problem. We don't have an exact number yet in terms of how many are retiring, but we do have at least some anecdotal evidence to suggest that people, again, go back to the uncertainty part, who have a, a pretty good, what we might call a nest egg, right? Maybe less inclined to going back. We have much more evidence right now of middle age workers uh, or, you know, mid career workers and younger workers more than older workers uh, who are leaving the workforce, or, or sorry, that, that are moving organizations versus with the older workers. It does seem that because of the reduced uncertainty, they may be more likely to leave the labor market um, because, again, they have some of the nest egg. Do we have exact numbers on that? Not yet. We don't have really any exact kind of data on that, but it certainly is. But beyond just kind of leaving for retirement, we also see anecdotally people leaving the labor force to the, the, their current organizations, I should say, to start up their own businesses, uh, things they may have done on the side, things that may be more passionate to them. So we do see some of that happening as well. In essence, there's a variety of reasons why people are leaving. And it's not just due to burnout and dissatisfaction. It can also be that the shock of the pandemic induced them to look for some other opportunities that they otherwise might not have pursued. And that includes, among other things, retirement. Um, another anonymous attendee asks, what is one practice in resolving the conflict of competitors offering jobs to your employees with 10 times more salary? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, this is, I think, where obviously higher pay and going back even to my research study that I mentioned earlier, higher pay can be an inducement for people to stay even when their coworkers are leaving. But higher pay externally can be an inducement to leave. How can you compete with a company that's offering 20% more pay? To be honest with you, the only thing that I can tell you in that regard is to go back to that Gallup research that I that I was mentioning earlier, that it will take a little more than a, on average, again, more than a 20% raise to lull a person away who is working for a boss who they feel really engages them. So again, this goes back to the leadership part that it's usually not just pay. There's usually a multitude of different factors that are influencing people uh, to leave an organization. And oftentimes, myself included, I get a little bit more myopic and thinking about pay as the reason why people leave, but there's usually a context behind that. And Gallup, the research shows that really, really well in that 
if that the the ha, working for a boss who engages them can counteract some of the effects of higher pay at least anything that's below 20 percent um once you get above that that's just hard to compete with frankly it's just hard to compete with without making some adjustments to the pay structure itself in the organization which again is 50 percent of ceos said they were doing as an effort to be able to retain top employees and as my research again showed makes a difference too in keeping employees um, another question is you mentioned the concerns of working moms returning to the workforce are you seeing any changes in maternity or paternal leave to attract and support those working moms? Um, what are any other benefit changes? Benefit changes are really, uh, you know, it's interesting. Benefits always used to be kind of this boring topic <laughs> the organizations sort of had, and they've become a really hot topic lately, in part because this is what organizations are discussing right now, too, the very things that you mentioned. I don't have data to suggest that the pandemic has done more to influence maternal or paternal leave policies, but I will say that societally we have moved more towards gener toward more generous maternal and paternal leave than we were even a decade or two decades decades ago, certainly. Um, I think it's a really interesting question. I do think that some of my colleagues here at Tippy, uh, I think about Beth Livingston, would be uh, probably better prepared to answer that question than I do. Uh, anecdotally, what we're finding from organizations is that they're rethinking their entire benefits package, whether it's maternal paternal leave or other types of benefits that they offer. And so will we see more generous maternal and paternal leave? My prediction is absolutely yes, but I think that was happening before the pandemic too. Um, and I think that it will continue to happen post pandemic. Um, let's see. Gregory McClanahan asks, how do you see the pending COVID mandates playing out over time? That is, many persons are quitting jobs and industries over refusal to vaccinate, but those industries may be closed into the future persons who continue to refuse to vaccinate. That is a really good question, and I think that's one of those where time will tell on that one. I think once again, this kind of goes back to any actions that CEOs or governments might take in response to the in, in response to pandemic or great resignation or anything else. There's always trade-offs. And so um, you know, as we mentioned before, with flexibility, there's trade-offs there. Uh, with increased pay, there's trade-offs there. And so I think that this is one of these two where there's some trade-offs and, and we have to honestly acknowledge those, but I don't know how that's going to play out in the future. Um, and I, I don't know that anybody quite knows what will happen um, as we do see that happening, as we do see some resignations happening that, it, you know, because of vaccine mandates. That said, we don't really have a clear sense of the magnitude of those. I think we have anecdotal evidence. We don't have empirical evidence yet about uh, at least really clear and long longitudinal empirical evidence about um, about the effective mask man or uh, the effective vaccine mandates on turnover. So I can't necessarily give a direct answer to your question. I think it's really interesting. I think time's going to tell as we continue collecting data on this. Um, I think this is a good one. With the high number of open positions plus the amount of time required to onboard onboard a new employee, it seems that current employees who've experienced job creep will likely continue to be putting in additional work for a while. Aside from monetary compensation, which may be limited by budgets, how else can managers best demonstrate their appreciation to their current employees? You know, one of the things that we find from research in terms of, you know, offering recognition to employees outside of pay is to honestly just recognize that they have job creep. <laughs> to just recognize that it's happening. A lot of times where workers, you know, uh, get frustrated with job creep is when job creep becomes an expectation rather than it's viewed as what we call in research extra role behavior. So when extra role kinds of expectations become folded in as what we call in role expectations, that's what oftentimes gets workers frustrated. And so part of it is just to recognize that they are doing things outside of the job scope. Now that said, again, going back to that corn fairy survey, you know, outside of pay, what else can you do to recognize that? 
uh, you know, there, there may be some things where you can obviously, you know, uh, you, 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 can, you can recognize the amount of work they have. But in the end, a lot of times what workers are looking for is they want you to put your money where your mouth is, in essence, not to say it too crudely like that, but that's essentially what, what it is. And so it's hard to imagine a future where individuals feel that there's job creep without there being some kind of an, uh, a, a raise in pay commensurate with the rise in expectations, frankly. Um, otherwise, what happens? happens in this is what burnout research shows is that when the demands exceed our resources to be able to address those psychologically economically or otherwise it's a recipe for burnout so just being cognizant of time i think we can probably get to two more questions and there are a lot of questions in the chat so um, i encourage you all to save those questions and then steve is happy to take those questions via email um, in case we don't get to you. So um, and any advice when you work for an organization who's resistant to increasing flexibility, what data can be shared to create a business case? Yeah, it's a really, it, that is a, a good question. What I would suggest, data that can be used for most organizations, not most, but many organizations will collect engagement surveys. They'll do various pulse surveys. I would definitely suggest using those kinds of, that kind of data to suggest what happens when you introduce remote work or flexible work options, what happens to employee engagement, what happens and, or any other measures that you might use. What happens um, to uh, those kinds of, those kinds of, again, outcomes that we're looking at in organizations. That's oftentimes a good place to start with data um, to do that. And then also from there, being able to just illustrate how that's especially affected for high performers. A lot of times in organizations we equate, and with good reason, high performers with really, you know, uh, I guess, uh, disproportionate uh, contributions to the organization. And it's an imperative for organizations to keep their high performers. How is this affecting the engagement of high performers in the organization to the extent to which you can break down that data or the extent to which you can gather stories and anecdotes around that, the more likely it is that people will be able to uh, um, understand a little bit more about some of the benefits and that you can gather some more about drawbacks also of flexible work too. Again, understanding that there's trade-offs involved with introducing more flexibility. Just to sort of sum up, there are a lot of questions just in general saying like, where did all these people go? And and how can they live if they're not working? And even taking into consideration, you know, maybe they have a hefty savings account or something that they're able to dip into. When will they come back? Are they going to come back? So I think maybe Steve, I'll just let you kind of wrap up along that uh, thematic, if you will, and then we'll go ahead and close the program. Yeah. I think you ask the question of the year. Um, the kinds of the kinds of data that are collected don't always get at those very kinds of questions. Bureau of Labor Statistics is collect not collecting that data. We're not getting a whole lot of data on that. And so I wish that I had more that I could share in terms of where they're at. What I will say is this, is that, again, we look at those economic, those social, and those psychological forces all together. And there's been some talk about, will this persist? Is this going to be forever? And, you know, although there's definitely some um, variance on this in terms of people's, you know, people's predictions as far as how long this will last, my prediction personally is that these economic, social, and psychological factors are brought in large part by the pandemic. There's a shifting in labor markets, but markets change, they evolve. And so will it forever be that we're in a great resignation? I'm not sure that we will be forever. When exactly will it return to normal? I'm not sure if what the normal we did before pre-pandemic is going to be the normal post-pandemic. But will people increasingly enter the labor force? Will people increasingly move around the labor force? Absolutely, yes. So I can't give you a timetable in terms of you know when that's going to happen, nor can I give you exact data. And this is where everybody is going. But Certainly, again, today, the economic, the psychological, and the social forces are all playing a role in people's desire to enter back into the market um, and people where they're going to in that market. Well, it's 101, so we're going to close up, but Steve's email is on that slide. So if we didn't get to your question, and I apologize, there were several, um, please email Steve. He'd be happy to continue this conversation with you um, over email. So. Thank you, Steve, and thank you everyone for attending the Tippy webinar presentation, The Great Resignation. 
Um, like I said, please feel free to contact Steve um, at his information on the screen. If you enjoyed this programming today and would like customized experiences like this for your organization, then like Steve said, visit the Tippy Leadership Collaborative website or reach out to him directly so he and his team can help you tackle your next big challenge. This is the perfect way to reconnect with your alma mater and access its internationally renowned experts to transform the future of your organization. And personally, I wanna echo Steve's comments from the beginning of this presentation as it is Veterans Day. I just wanna take a moment to thank all of our veterans and their family members of those who have served and thank you all for your sacrifice. You are also heroes to me and my family and we are forever grateful for your service. Um, when this event ends in just a moment, you will see a quick survey. We'd be grateful if you could share your thoughts and help us make future Tippy virtual events even better. On behalf of the Tippy College of Business, thank you for joining us this afternoon and go Hawks.